welcome back to the Tiberium Armory series. Today we're going to be talking about the evolution of defenses in the Global Defense Initiative. The Global Defense Initiative has had decades to develop their te defensive technologies to better suit the changing battlefield of the Tiberium future, and they have done very well for themselves, all things considered. In this video, I will lay out the different defensive technologies used by the GDI over the course of this history and describe its changing attitude towards the defense and technology. To begin with, one not, cannot start with the Guard Tower of Tiberium Dawn, as that is not really where the story begins. The First Tiberium War does not start until 2019, of course, and as stated in other videos, such as the Predator Tank video, most of the equipment used in the process of the First Tiberium War was not the experimental tech equipment found on either side of the war, but rather the older pre-Tiberium Western and Warsaw Pact technology of the late Cold War. This is because, by the time the war started, only 24 years had passed since the Green Crystal had made it to Earth and began ravaging the planet, leading a chaotic few years in which to develop and construct all of the tech of the future. Most defensive technologies used in this period were very similar to the technologies that had been used in the First and Second World Wars, sandbags, pillboxes, and trenches. Over the course of the Cold War, more were developed, allowing for development of Stinger sites, advanced fire bases, and others, such as the Patriot missile system. It was these defensive systems that were primarily used in the First Tiberium War, along with the Guard Tower, a standard low-cost defensive structure, and the Advanced Guard Tower, a larger version equipped with a larger array of weapons. The Standard Guard Tower was a sandbag wooden tower equipped with a high, high-power machine gun, notably in the game a MG3, but often others as well, as the more common NATO M240 or M2, depending on where the battle was taking place. Defenses built in areas where haste was not as important often had concrete on the pilings and along the sides to give it additional durability versus small arms fire. While it is possible for infantry to fire rockets out of the structure, it wasn't usually done as the structure itself is essentially without defense regarding armored vehicles or especially high caliber weapons. The Advanced Guard Tower was the first real innovation over the Cold War technology for GDI. Fully armored in metal plating and often with concrete reinforcement, the tower was equipped to deal with any threat, from infantry to tanks and even aircraft. Armed with communication antennas, it was even able to detect stealth vehicles and defeat them with Tomahawk missiles fired in pairs from the base. These extremely heavy anti-material weapons were held in bulk with enough numbers that the structure could be relied on to cull ma massed vehicular assaults. In fact, these structures were so durable that miniaturized WMDs that the Brotherhood often used to terrorize GDI forces would often target these structures first, as most Nod forces were hardened against fallout. In the Second Tiberium War, the height of the GDI technical development, came the successor of the Advanced Guard Tower, the Component Tower. This structure was a part of a new modular system of defenses that GDI rolled out in an effort to standardize all of their equipment across their growing pseudo-empire, and was frequently built into the new durable wall sections developed for deep operations defense in lieu of barbed wire fencing. The tower itself is a large plug-like structure that could fit any of the three turret options inside and accommodate their ammunition's needs universally. The first in the turrets available to the commander was the Vulcan Cannon, dual 50mm miniguns that tore through all but the heaviest infantry and lightly armored vehicles with ease. The second option was the RPG Launcher, which fired law rockets at any vehicular targets and dealt splash damage to nearby enemies. While less a heavy defense than the AGT's Tomahawk missiles, the tower was able to keep a larger magazine in the tower itself, much more rapid and higher volume salvos. The last of the defensive structures in the component tower was the SAM battery, which fired short and long range missiles at aircraft at nearly any vector. Finally, there was the Firestorm defensive structure that would help to dominate the battlefield, 
which was the EMP cannon, a support artillery piece used to disrupt formations on the attack during the course of a battle. It is speculated that the EMP cannon used small nuclear devices in its shells to deliver the EMP effect, as the piece itself was known to arc its shots, and purely energy-based shots would not be able to do this. These formidable structures would go away the way of the mammoth MK2 Walker with the closing of the Second Tiberium War, however, and the Second Death of Cain. Each structure was switched out for a cheaper version as the short-sighted civilian government downscaled the GDI's military capability, causing it to be less potent during the Third Tiberium War and the evasion of the Skrin. The first of the structures to be downgraded was the so-called Watchtower. A step down in nearly all respects, the Watchtower fired two twin-link 20mm cannons, railguns, at high speed, ripping through individual infantry units but having significant trouble with large groups of enemies. Its one advantage was that it was so tall as to be able to fire over most buildings, making it difficult to destroy for enemies not already behind the walls. It had a late war AP ammo upgrade, which gave it the ability to put down anything it fired upon with extreme prejudice, even felling tanks with enough sustained fire, beating the armor of small timed explosives in the rounds until the armor itself was battered into pieces. The second structure to be dumbed down was the RPG launcher, which was switched out the RPGs for a less expensive 105mm shell. This fairly low caliber gun struggled with heavy, heavily armored targets until the late war addition of the railgun, which allowed it to compete with much heavier enemies. The one advantage of the structure was that it was extremely durable and remotely controlled and automated, taking humans out of the field of fire. Structure number three was the SAM site, and in this one respect, there may have been an improvement. The AA battery wields two twin-linked 30mm Gatling guns loaded with depleted uranium or tungsten shells that are surprisingly effective even against screen heavy aircraft many times its size. The AA battery has a stunningly fast fire rate of 5,000 RPM, an extensive magazine ca capacity stored underground, and a target acquisition system that allows it to follow stealthy aircraft even after they've lost sight of them, almost guaranteeing a kill. One of the prime advantages of these vehicles is that they're multi-purpose, allowing the gun to take down missiles, aircraft, UAVs, and other threats autonomously, without any impact or input from a human being. And lastly, the final defensive structure to be built by the GDI in the Third Tiberium War was the Sonic Emitter, a terraforming device turned base defense designed primarily to help blue and yellow zones deal with the Tiberium and use using a technology based on a weapon from the Second Tiberium War. This tower was called upon to aid the GDI when it was realized that the Screen Invaders had a weakness to sonic waves. At the end here, I hope everyone has had a chance to learn a little bit more about the base defenses of the GDI across all of the different eras that it was present in. And I just want to say, Happy New Year to everyone. This is Game Master Karakin signing off. Hope to see you again soon. Bye.